Right. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to the Adaptations panel chat um, for the Right Women Book Fest 2021. I'm your moderator, Cardin Brooks, author, reviewer, inventor, and outreach coordinator for this event, uh, which was founded by author Heather Brooks, who writes as H.L. Brooks, uh, no relation. <laughs> so our illustrious panelists are Cecilia Tan, Oh, Saida, you know I didn't ask you how to pronounce your last name. Please pronounce Ruas. <laughs> thank you, Ruas. <laughs> oh, it was on my list and I didn't double check. Uh, thank you. LP Kersey and Karen Janowski. So um, I'll invite them to introduce themselves and their bookish vibes um, before we begin our chat. And let's start with Cecilia. Okay, hi, uh, I'm Cecilia Chan. I'm a novelist. Uh, I write romance, science fiction, fantasy, urban fantasy, a, a lot of different uh, genres. So um, many of which are getting a lot of adaptations these days. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and for many years, I was the, um, the editorial director of a small publisher called Circlet Press. Um, now I'm just an editor because Circlet is now a part of Riverdale Avenue Books. So I no longer have to do all the work, just some of the work, <laughs> which is nice. So yeah, that's me. Awesome. Uh, Saida? Yeah, hello. My name's Saida Uras. Um, I'm a British author of Moroccan heritage. Uh, my, my pronouns are she and her. Um, and I'm a, I write historical fiction, but also some kind of contemporary fiction as well. And uh, I've contributed to anthologies and write short pieces and various things. And, um, and yeah, that's me. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Karen. Hello, my name is Karen Janowski, and I was going to show a picture of at least one of the books, but it appears I've given them all away and don't have one anymore. <laughs> um, I write literary fiction that combines a mashup of several other genres, including primarily superheroes, but also time travel, and it covers a lot of heavier themes than some most superheroes books do, like um, gender and PTSD and all, you know, history and all kinds of other stuff. Thank you very much. And as a reader who is about 75% through the fourth book, having read the first three, um, I can say that they are delicious. Uh, so <laughs> LP. Hi, I am LP. Um, my bookish vibes. Um, I write a little bit of speculative fiction, a little bit of erotic fiction. Um, I am an aspiring poet. I have my first poetry chapbook that is in the works. Hopefully I'll be done with it by the end of the year. It's called The Whole Phase. So that, that, that should be a little, a little spicy. Um, I am also the founding editor of Obsidian Pen Publishing. I am the host and curator of the monthly literary, uh, reading series called The Literary Cipher. And I am currently the submissions and story editor at Afrocentric Books and Mugwamp Press. And that is it, I think. That's all fantastic. So let me say this before we get into it, that, you know, I am currently reading the fourth book in Karen's uh, series, but I've read quite a bit of um, Saida and Cecilia's work and same level of praise in terms of um, beautiful composition of language and characterizations and uh, being thought provoking without being um, sad. <laughs> and all of your work. And I will say, um, I had the great uh, pleasure and privilege of participating in uh, LP's uh, Literary Cipher for, I want to say August, the oh, months kind of, the months yeah, kind of blend together, <laughs> blends together in a pandemic. Um, <laughs> and it was such a beautiful experience. Um, I felt so welcomed as a participant and all the other participants were so uh, talented and gifted and uh, really inspiring. So I'm looking forward to this conversation that we're going to begin with the public conversation that Shonda Rhimes's adaptation of uh, the Bridgerton series, which is a romance uh, series by um, a a long-term, very popular um, romance author, uh, Julia Quinn. So um, I have not seen the series, uh, but I have read 
almost everything Julia Quinn has written. Uh, so I'm just gonna open up with my impressions of Julia Quinn, which is all these years that I've read her because she's considered mainstream, which I think we all know is usually considered Anglo-Caucasian white, heterocentric, a certain minimal level of privilege, that kind of thing. Um, and so as a black woman who enjoys Julia Quinn, what I realized is that when I read her books, when it goes to language that tells me it's going to be a physical description, I skip it because mm -hmm. it's not going to be me <laughs> as the person, you know, as be considered or someone like me considered desirable and all that. And mm -hmm. I, I realized that I, oh, I just skip over that because what I care about is the emotional arc and the mm -hmm. personality traits, mm -hmm. not so much mm -hmm. the physical traits. So I was curious to know from each of you, um, and any anyone can start, which is when that conversation started or when you were aware of it, or even maybe when I invited you to participate on this panel, if that's what made you aware of it, what were some of your first feelings or thoughts about it, about this idea of taking source material that really has no ethnic uh, range <laughs> and kind of superimposing a variety of ethnicities uh, into it, so. Right, well, I saw the series. I haven't read the books because Re Regency novels are kind of Regency novels. I know what's gonna happen. I know how it's gonna end. But the series had Reggae John Cage and some sort of plot involved. There were other characters and it had Reggae John Cage. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm a, a couple of things about changing the race and um, ethnicity of different characters from their original to screen or the other way around. I agree that there's too much homogeneity in most romance novels and actually most TV shows as well. And I was very happy to see that diversity. On the other hand, they changed the skin color. They did not change anything having to do really with the kind of heritage or history or baggage that other ethnicities carry with them. They refer to it a little bit once in a while, but it doesn't change the fact that it's, I feel like in some ways, like it's Anglo and a different, um, different kind of, um, different color. Mm -hmm. Like I've watched the series, I haven't read the books, and so I didn't understand, I couldn't make that comparison. But the one thing that I liked about the series is that it didn't root the 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 kind of black characters in a racial identity. For me, that was something that I found quite for refreshing that their backstory didn't have to have anything to do with race, or maybe it does, but it wasn't like the kind of core of who they are. Because sometimes I get a bit tired of of that as well, where it's like every time you have you know, in the UK, what we would call a minority person in a show or in a book, somehow their race or ethnicity is a part of their backstory. And they can't just be somebody who's kind of got angst about romance and has commitment problems or commitment issues. No, they've got, it comes from. And so for me, I found that quite refreshing about the series. But like, uh, Cardine, the thing that you made me think about when you posed the question was, like I always thought, well, well, after I watched it, I thought this is a great thing. Like it's it's great. Why not? Like what what you know? Uh, but now it, you made me wonder. Well, why why do you get like why do you superimpose on these kind of you know stories and not find stories from people that are underrepresented and kind of make, invest in those stories instead? Yeah, of course. But you know, it just made me think that on one hand it's great, but those those writers those creatives are they getting those kind that kind of access as well yeah, yeah. You know, i am sorry i am um, was talking to somebody once i used to work in a law firm and there was one woman of color there who she and i were the old, two oldest people in the firm aside from the lawyers because they mostly hired cheap college kids that they could boss around but um she had come from washington dc and moved to southern maryland and we were talking about some about how sometimes, at least where I am, because it's rural, because it's so red down here, that we um, often, I, that I said that I have learned from a young age how to hide 
my heritage. Um, and uh, yep, okay, Merry Christmas to you too. But, and she said to me, I can't hide who I am. And it's true. So I, I think Sayed and I have opposite reactions to this. By, I, I think that the colors and the heritage are whitewashed because the experience still belongs and they are still acting as if they were white for the most part. And so I think that under um, that, that subtext of there are other approaches to these characters was missing and it was sorely missing. Yeah, I have to agree with that, Karen. Um, I did see the show. I didn't read the book. Um, I remember watching it and, you know, well, it is refreshing to see characters where um, it's not that same narrative where their entire storyline is based on them being black. Everything is about them being black. The you know they're oppressed because they're black. They can't get ahead because they're black. Everything is about black. Um, it was refreshing to not see that um, same narrative dragged out. It was missing that um, component up until the queen mentioned something about. Um, she made some reference to how they were treated before the king actually fell in love with one of us. That's what she said. It. Hmm. And then I guess things kind of shifted. Um, but to Karen's point, yeah, they, you know, there was like this sort of assimilation um, of their blackness with this society that they're in. There was nothing that made them stand out. I mean, you see that they're black, but, you know, what is it about them that, you know, what is their history? How did they get there? How did the queen end up? Mm -hmm. So I don't know if this if the book goes into that, but I know on the show we're just like, okay, well, what's you know, where's their where's their flavor, you know, where's their soul? They just kind of just rolling with the, you know, the Duke and the you know this mm -hmm. and the that, you know, where's the you know, the other stuff? So yeah, yeah, I I feel like it's an important step that what the what Shonda Rhimes really did was she took mm -hmm. two sort of um, long standing. Uh, traditions, if you want to call it that. One is of cross-race casting, which has been, I mean, you can read articles from, you know, Broadway shows of the 1970s where they finally cast a non-white singer or actor in a part, in a classic, you know, whatever, uh, Oklahoma, Chicago, you know, et cetera, that, um, uh, you know, and then, and people, it's like their minds were blown just to see a non-white person doing a thing. And then they don't change the text. They don't change the songs. They don't change the whatever. But it brings a whole different sort of adaptation to it. And then, of course, the most recent big thing like that was they decided to cast Hermione with a Black actress in the Harry Potter Cursed Child uh, plays. And and now that they're planting Cursed Child plays elsewhere, I mean, pan post-pandemic, um, they've continued to cast always the Black actress for that role. And, uh, and they don't really change anything else. I mean, she, she's supposed to have the whole same history that Hermione Granger had being the top student at Hogwarts and all that. And now she's, you know, Minister for Magic. And it's like, and it just makes you think, but it's not enough. I mean, obviously it's not enough. The other, yeah, the other tradition that she brings in is, um, is that there's a tradition within romance of basically having kind of alternate history where you're just like, uh, it, we often see this in gay romance where we're, we have gay mm -hmm. historicals where we're just like, okay, we know that in real situations, you know, this would never be allowed and so forth and so on. And and it's it, in, in fanfic, we call it homo okay, where it's just like, we just, it, everything's exactly the same, except we've just decided to say that, you know, but in this alternate universe, we don't have the same kind of homophobia. And so they were not dragged into the street mm -hmm. and killed. Instead, they just get mm -hmm. to have their romance like everyone else. Mm -hmm. um, Again, it's not they enough, that, but it's a step. <laughs> I think they do that in Shit's Creek, right? In the TV show. In Shit's Creek. Shit's Creek. Very, very, that's, a, that's a kind of the way it's done there, which I found really great to watch as a result. But, yeah. I, I guess with that kind of thing, to me, they were just going to pretend mm -hmm. that everything is so much different. I, usually when I read something like that, I go, oh, this is stupid. This is BS. No. And just walk away from it. Mm -hmm. um, because again, the standard, the neutral is still Anglo, right. no yeah. matter what. Yeah. So it, I'm not saying that it had things have to be completely revised so that they incur, en encompass other religions and races struggles, mm -hmm. but it needs to be acknowledged because like my friend said at the law firm, I can't hide who I am. This is mm -hmm. me. You know? And reggae John Page aside, <laughs> <laughs> Got to miss it with um, it, it's, it, it, the race issue is still there. 
So I, Karen, you made me laugh so much about the reggae Jean Page because the whole reason it, uh, that Bridgerton series even went on my radar is because I had seen a trailer or something with him and I recognized him from We the People, For the People, whatever. It was a Shonda Rhyme show that only lasted like two or three seasons. And that uh, when I watched the premiere for that show, I was like, who is that man? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I, am, I, I found out about him because he hosted Saturday Night Live and mm -hmm. the women in the audience were going nuts. So I said, I yeah. this is all about. <laughs> yes. yes. So I thought that that was, so here's the bigger thing. I would love to have a conversation with Shonda Rhimes about her intention because of maybe like five or six years ago, I can't remember exactly when, she had a series called Star Crossed or it was, if that's not exactly the series, but it came on ABC and it was, was it Romeo and Juliet? I can't, it was Shakespeare, but it was an ethnically inclusive cast. Now the first year, the first season it came on, it had like a, I think it had a prime location, like Wednesday night, or Thursday night, whatever night her her top tier shows were coming on, it came on after that. And then I guess people didn't understand what she was trying to do. Mm -hmm. I think the second season it moved to Saturday, which is like the kiss of death for network yeah. television. Yeah. Um, and I don't think it had three seasons. I think, I think it only had two seasons. I think the second season was super short. But I say that for context because when people were upset or confused by what she was doing with the casting for Bridgerton, mm -hmm. it wasn't, it looked very familiar to me because I'm like, oh, well, that's what she did with Starcross and it didn't work. So she approached it in a new way or tweaks mm -hmm. it and then went to Netflix got more money and more, I guess, faith um, mm -hmm. and maybe, and then Julia Quinn with Julia Quinn's like um, established fandom and readership and mm -hmm. then romance readers and fans in general. Mm -hmm. And then that's how she made, made the switch. So mm -hmm. that's my whole mm -hmm. tangent to say, I'm curious from Shonda Rhimes, what's her goal? Because all of you, mm -hmm. I agree with all of your points. Mm -hmm. Like Karen, I totally understand what you're saying about you, you can't just do a superficial inclusion or representation yeah. because the skin you're in, even if you know you're a full-fledged human being and citizen of the world, depending on your skin and your sexual orientation and all that, yeah. the world doesn't treat you that way usually. Yeah. And so that's going to inform your character. So to act like it doesn't feels, I don't know, lazy or, mm -hmm. you know, or at least not very deep, right? Mm -hmm. But Rita, I totally understand your feeling of refreshment, like, because it is refreshing, especially for those of us who are black and brown to, and not Christian or, you know, whatever the not mainstream parts of ourselves are, it is refresh, refreshing to watch entertainment and just be entertained, mm -hmm. right? right? And not, yeah. not have it to be this heavy, mm -hmm. It has to be a so, Right. There's one Black character and all of it is is an embodiment of different kinds of trauma. Right. <laughs> you mentioned, yeah. um, you mentioned um, Shakespeare and you know, I, I understand how biased I am because I teach college literature. But um, the, I think really the one, I, don't, I haven't seen all the adaptations of Romeo and Juliet, but the one that really, really worked well was um, actually West Side Story. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. the sharks embraced yes. part of it was part of it, this was they were all from Puerto Rico and they were mistreated and they did deal with racism and the people mm -hmm. that were in the jets all came from various different Anglo backgrounds and one so mm -hmm. the Pollock or he's a this he's a that and mm -hmm. the story of Romeo and Juliet was rock solid mm -hmm. it was right there but they were able to incorporate other things without mm -hmm. laying it down without making it really didactic or anything like that. And right. I'd like to see more adaptations do that. Mm. Yeah. You know, what's funny is that I had completely forgotten that West Side Story was an adaptation of Romeo and Juliet. <laughs> like yeah. that's already like so far back in my memory of it. It's like, that's right. I, you yeah. know, 
I think I, yeah, when it's really done well, you almost forget where you almost forget. Yeah. And, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 And like, Karen, I wanted to. Sorry. No, I was just going to say, is the new West Side Story, is that coming out at the end of this year or the beginning of next year? I think Steven Spielberg is doing one. It should never be made. He is messing with perfection. <laughs> <laughs> he deserves a good smack across the face. For this. I, don't care I, I think it's that. already a done deal. I've seen yeah. some trailers. I just can't remember what the date is. I, I don't remember any date now. I'm in New York City and I know what the musical is supposed to have in it. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, it never be that. So I, I was just going to say, like, I think like the conversation is just making me think about like character and like when you're writing a character or when or you when you're living yourself. There's a, there's this line between like agency and your social position, right? And so it's really about you know, do you like how often do you see you know people from minoritized groups? with full agency including mm -hmm. what they choose to play right. to society or mm -hmm. like you know present to society and what they choose not to present to society from their experience mm -hmm. and how often do you see people from minoritized groups just mm -hmm. as these kind of conduits of their social position right mm -hmm. and i think that kind of line and you're I, I agree karen like it's about like there's finding a line where mm -hmm. um like you know where you kind of meet a line that you feel is the mm -hmm. line that you want to get mm -hmm. to but you know i i think that's that i'm tired of where you see oh god here we go again it's another mm -hmm. minor yeah. person with yeah. the burdens that society puts on them right. they, yeah. their agency is diminished as a result and mm -hmm. I, think, you know, I, think that, I guess the, that's what it's made I, me think of I've got to yeah. bring up the uh, I've got to bring up the the ultimate you know sort of cross race casting that we've seen you know happen in in recent memory, which is Hamilton. I mean, oh yes, <laughs> you know just, I mean talk about people's minds being blown. I mean yeah. it's just it's a reason it's one of the Broadway shows that's come back you know pre pandemic because it was so hard to get a ticket to see it, and then you know like that's what we did last July fourth was we just made plans to watch the live stream of the you know or the you know the adaptation that they had done a, a film version of it, and it was just like you know um, it was and being in that context of American history American and race, history. you yeah. know, r race and immigration's mm -hmm. place in American history, but then just presented as here's just the story of you the know, story. Hamilton's life. And we're just going to cast yeah. all people of color in the cast. And it was like, it just was another thing that just like made you think and made you think and made you think. And I have to bring up though, that I think Bridgerton doesn't happen if Outlander doesn't have the huge success that it has. Mm -hmm. You're exactly and right. Outlander's another one of these things that when it was published, people didn't know what to do with it. It was like, it didn't quite exactly fit in the box. It's like, it was romance, but it was time travel, but it was this, but it was that. It's banned mm -hmm. from eras, you know, and it, it did a lot of things. And then for them to try to bring that to the screen, it was like they took things that were special and different about the book and then, you know, made them strengths instead of weaknesses, which is one of the things that you can do in an adaptation that sometimes I think, you know, um, things that are unique to a book, it's about what can you translate in that will add value to the audience and to mm -hmm. the entertainment value as opposed to just flattening or taking it away. And yeah. But I think another yeah. successful version of that actually comes from comic books. Um, the character of Sam, Falcon, mm. um, in Andrew's movies. If you've if you've seen um, Falcon and Winter Soldier, the series, TV short series, yes, they Maybe. address this very, very subtly for the most part. You know, mm. he's walking down the street, and he he and his friend, who's white, are stopped. Is this is this man bothering you, sir? Oh, I didn't realize it was you. Oh, can I have your autograph? Can we get a selfie? All of a yeah. sudden, everything changes. And on the other hand, they flipped um, the um, Nick Fury character, who in the comic books generally is white, He's white. Mm -hmm. cigar in his mouth. And mm -hmm. I can't imagine him any other ethnicity than the one that, um, oh crap, what's his name? Samuel, Samuel Jackson. Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> his mannerisms and his general you know, attitude towards the character fits exactly the way it's supposed to, even though it doesn't really you know, attach itself much to the comic book series anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they embody That's how I am with it. that issue. Yeah. Yeah. I always, always, you know, when I would read um, the comics and, 
you know, look at, you know, Nick Fury, the way he was illustrated. He just didn't, I don't know. I never really could embody him as a person until I saw Samuel Jackson. I was like, that's that that's how he should have looked in the not how he should have looked, but in my mind, you know, Nick Fury would be Samuel Jackson, even mm -hmm. though in the comics he wasn't portrayed as such. And I think just to go back to the other point, just real quick, I think whenever you are um talking about inclusion, I think inclusion is important, but not at the cost of um erasure. You know what I mean? Yeah. Inclusion, yeah. erasure, that kind of thing. So, um, and I remember a chat with Bozeman one time. My, my heart. Mm -hmm. Um, he mentioned it once, and he was talking about um, being cast for a role, and they just wanted a black guy to fill that role. And he was like, "Well, you know, well, how am I supposed to play his role? What's his history? Does he have a backstory? What is his backstory? Mm -hmm. You know, is it, you know, oh well, you know, he's th th just just read your lines." I was like, well, does he have a father? Where's his father? Where's his yeah. mother? Where was he raised? Mm -hmm. You know, so you could kind of connect to that character better. Mm -hmm. And they didn't have it. They didn't bother to write it because they didn't see the importance of it. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So I think with Bridgerton, that's how I kind of, I don't, like I said, I haven't read the book, but looking at it on screen, that's how I felt. I just really couldn't connect to um, the Black characters because it was like, well, where, you know, where's their story? At? Where's their, you know, where's their, you know, Chateau? Where's their, although I did with the, um, with, Re with Ray J's character, I always call him Reggie, but <laughs> with Reggie's character, we did get to see a glimpse into his, you know, with his dad and his mom, that mm -hmm. whole, you know, but as far as anybody else, it was like, okay, well, how did the rest of the people in the black community, how they connect? Do they, why you are know, people so accepting of it? Yeah. Why are they so accepting mm -hmm. of it? So, yeah. Mm -hmm. But that ties in, though, to my curiosity about Shonda Rhimes's Shonda's intent. kind of intention, because mm -hmm. is she like so LP? So you and I maybe are looking at it in a certain way, because even for enjoyment, we're thinking black people with all this power and money and what and nobody's yeah. challenging that nobody's like oh, yeah, it's almost, good y'all queen is black right. with a whole right. Right. right almost to a certain extent it's impo it's impossible to suspend disbelief like really <laughs> like there's no yeah everybody's just accepting this as normal so but is shonda rhymes trying to expand the expectations or possibilities for people who aren't black or even for black people who, for legitimate reasons, can't imagine a world in which anyway. black people are in the upper echelon, that powerful, that yeah. wealthy, mm -hmm. that whatever. So I, that's why I'm really curious about her because mm -hmm. it feels like it's she's using in, uh, entertainment, sexiness, visual mm -hmm. voluptuousness yeah. to to expand people's minds without yes. their knowing it or being yeah. conscious of it. Yeah. Um, and so, I, well, if I cast these characters, I'm going to get this demographic too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, so, there is a the whole thing where a Hollywood yeah. adaptation or even, even a Netflix adaptation, sometimes they've, they're they trying to figure out, yeah, where's all the money going to come from? Who's going to watch this? Business, right? yeah. And I mean, I think what they're finding is that Romance Landia. If, you know, we'll we'll watch it at least for a while, you know, no matter what it is, because there's right. been such a sort of a lack of romance mm -hmm. on TV and in movies. It's like the yeah. rom-com has kind of disappeared and yeah. been replaced by just more and more action movies that have romantic subplots, but then they drop them the second that they, yes. it doesn't serve the, the action yeah. plot, you know, that yeah. kind of a thing. It's just, you know, I don't know. But uh, lots of lots of loves of your life who end up dead. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. And then, you know, or just relationships that like they, they start to happen, but then, you know, the next director takes over the next version of the movie or the next one in the series and they decide yeah, to rewrite it and change it. And, mm -hmm. You know, you're just like, what? But I mean, on the one hand, like the, like the, the Marvel movies, okay, they're coming from a comic book world. Mm -hmm. Comic books are always about reinvention and sort of re having to reuse those characters over and over and over yeah. again. And you've got to tell the story of Superman 800 times because the comic book comes out every week, week every month, whatever the, the schedule is. Now, right? And it's right. like, you know, and sometimes writers are like, haven't all the stories about Superman been told? No, they haven't. You have to come up with something new, right? So they're yeah. constantly being reinvented. And one of the ways to reinvent them is to 
you know, have a new version of the character who is a different yeah. race, different background. And, and it's been wonderful to see some of the adaptations that have been going on in mainstream comics, you know, with um, Muslim characters and black characters and, you know, so yeah. forth. And um, now we're getting starting to get the the Asian characters are being sort of, their stories are being retold. We're finally getting the Shang-Chi the Shang -Chi. The Shang -Chi. Shang -Chi story. You know, I'm just like, oh, I'm, it's on my, it's on my watch list. I have, I'm, I'm not going to movie theaters yet. So I'm waiting for yeah, it. To same. Streaming. <laughs> yeah, just yeah, I, just go back a step. I think some of it comes from also like the, the whole period drama thing. So like in the UK, we've got Downton Abbey, right? And yes, it's a great kind of that. adaptation of this period, mm -hmm. but be, there's just, it's all white people and people and it's like you know there's this thing that people say you know like if you only if you only want to cast white people make a period drama mm -hmm. that's the kind of thing that some people say in, in like that i've heard people in the uk right because that's your right. justification mm -hmm. right yeah. and, and i think there is an element where people have gone like enough with the period dramas where you know mm -hmm. the black and brown people are either slaves or servants or they just don't exist. Right. Yeah, right. Screen, right. right. You just don't so, see yeah, them. You just, yeah. They just yeah. 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 yeah, they're just yeah. like they're not even present in the in the country. Right. And so I think it is trying to take that period drama mm -hmm. and do something different with the period drama because it is so popular and it's so well liked, and we all love a bit of kind of you know whatever Regency Victorian era, right. whatever it is, right? Right, because the escapism that it offers, right? Yeah. Because for yeah. all of us as contemporary people of twenty as twenty first century adults, there is something romantic, not as in the pairing up kind of thing, but romantic about the imaginings of that mm -hmm. that time. And then of course, then when you see a documentary or you read about you know sanitation and, and whatnot that's you know, and that, and right, it, right, right. It, it becomes a bit like it is interesting because we like we you know one show has generated so much debate because of the choices it made around color right and yet historically choices were always made around color but mm -hmm. it's never generated so much mm -hmm. all so those right. choices were about erasing it right yeah but suddenly mm -hmm. this yeah. one choice has generated a worldwide debate about whether or not, you know, it's right, right or wrong. And it's an interesting mm -hmm. kind of thing that, you know, like historical accuracy becomes a problem mm -hmm. on, when it comes to race, but yeah. not yeah. the other choices that you make right. tell a story. Right. right. Oh, well, right. that's so powerful. That's really powerful. It yeah. is. Mm -hmm. It's just. Well, I like that. I like that. No, okay, so that now that's got me thinking. Yeah. <laughs> just makes you think, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Karen, I'm sorry, I missed you. It's, the thing about the comic books is those were created for the most part to challenge a lot of political assumptions. Superman is the Jewish immigration story, and he was written mm -hmm. by a Jewish guy. Captain America, he's Catholic, but he was mm -hmm. written by a couple of Jewish guys, same time period. Wonder mm -hmm. Woman, written by people that are kind of on the fringes of the women movement at the time. Mm -hmm. And as times change, you're right, they reinvent themselves. So 9-11, we have the bad guys as anti-Muslim. You know, it, and actually, it was, um, the comic books had become so inclusive in terms of, not, of racism, that not being um, racist, that the government actually started a committee that they have to follow certain guidelines. They're not allowed to say certain things or show certain things because of decency. Um, so you know, these, these issues, they're, they're entertainment and a lot of the time they're light and we don't think about them much, but really that light entertainment eventually filters through. Mm -hmm. yes. It sends a message and, it's, and either, it both represents and creates kind of a, the status quo. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, I like that. I like that. So, uh, go ahead, LP. LP. Oh no, I wasn't. I was just agreeing mm -hmm. with Karen. That's why I love yeah. comics. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I love comics and I love television um, because the visual medium gives you such an impact. I mean, obviously, I'm a writer. I write books, but there's stuff you can put on the page, and you can think you're making it extremely obvious. Mm -hmm. And then when people see the adaptation on the screen, I mean, look at how people freaked out about it, how in. Um, uh, in the Mockingjay books and, oh. you know, that, I mean, there's a black character in the books and when they cast a black actress, people were like, oh, no, no, no. Like that people were flipping out. And I mean, because they didn't see it that way. And it's, yeah. you know, it's like- I had well, totally how? forgotten about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's like, 
you know, so it's almost like it's almost an imperative that we have to take some white characters and cross, you know, cross right. race cast them in order to kind of, I don't know, balance it Keep out. It I, mean, my, my, mm -hmm. I wrote a, I wrote a nonfiction book about Harry Potter. That is um, uh, the binge watcher's guide to the Harry Potter movies. And it's specifically about, you know, it's like, it's like a, a travel guide through the, through the films. Right. And, um, and one of the things that's interesting about the films is that there are a lot of, um, you know, J.K. Rowling for all her faults, and there are many, and I'm not going to go into it because that would be a whole other panel. Um, <laughs> he, he had created this sort of diverse cast of backstory characters. You know, it's like mm -hmm. all the main characters are white, but it's like she gave them this diverse cast of friends with, mm -hmm. you know, Asian and black and, you know, so forth and so on. And so then those actors are all on the screen and mm -hmm. it empowered a whole fandom to be more diverse, essentially. Um, when I was yeah. at my first big Harry Potter convention, it was far more diverse than the literary book-based science fiction conventions I had been attending. And I, of course, being sort of anthropology type person, you know, I went around asking people like, I'm like, why are you here? How did you end up at this giant hotel in Chicago paying all this money to be here? And all of them were like, I felt included in this book, which is why I am a fan of this and, you know, not some other thing. And it was just like, it was like that simple. It was just like, oh my gosh, really? Is, is, was it that simple? And it really was, is that people felt they had permission to be there because they yeah. saw themselves represented. Saw themselves. Like, yeah. okay. On the other hand, you don't want it to be pure tokenism. Right, right. Yeah. I mean, one of our arguments about Harry Potter mm -hmm. is that, of course, there's all this diversity, but it's all in the second tier characters, right. you know? Right. So, you know, like, as well as like the invisible gay characters who are like, oh, after the book's published, you can announce that Dumbledore is, is gay. And then we're like, oh, and so he was just another sad gay who died alone. You know, like how, this is not, this is not what we call good representation. Yeah. You know, like, yeah, this is what we call repeating bad tropes. <laughs> you know, exactly. Like, so in the UK, yeah. we have we had Channel 5, oh, which nice. is like a, a public channeled service, yeah. and they did an adaptation of Anne Boleyn, Henry VIII, real character, you know, true, mm -hmm. part of British history, and they cast uh, uh, Jodie Turner-Smith, who is mm -hmm. a British actress of uh, Jamaican descent, as Anne Boleyn. And you know, like that, and and that just you should have seen the Twitter storm that kicked off because, like, historic, you know, like people like, but mm. Anne Boleyn wasn't black. You can't mm. cast a black actress for a woman that actually existed in history. And it's a really interesting kind of conversation that's ensued because it's it's like, no, we're not even dealing with like fantasy here. We're going to deal with history, <laughs> and we're going to make a historical figure. You know, like, and so it's just a really interesting conversation that's kind of happened as a result and mm -hmm. the various kind of explanations that um, they've done. But I th I mean, personally, I think it's a, a great thing. I don't like, mm -hmm. you know, we bend history all the time for stories. So yeah, what does it matter? You know what my response to the, yeah, Anne Boylan wasn't, wasn't black or um, my usual response really pisses people off and gets me unfriended because I'll say, neither were Moses and Jesus, but Pater is white. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's my thing. Like, you know, like I, I exactly that's that's exactly my thing. Like I grew up in a Muslim world. <laughs> Since we're changing colors so anyway, we might as well. <laughs> it doesn't have to be historically correct. Like, how come Yeah, yeah, exactly. But right. it kind of you know, there were people that were not happy about it. But like I grew up in a Muslim household and we, my dad, we used to watch The Message, right, which is a story about Prophet Muhammad and his best friend, Hamza, and it's and he's and it's Anthony, Anthony Quinn playing his best friend. And, you know, Anthony Quinn is nowhere near the Saudi area, you know, like, he's like not from there at all. But like you just it's just done, right? Like, you know, Muslim characters, um, Asian characters, you just kind of swap them over, African characters, you swap them over all the time, no question. Or the, you know, or the older practice in the 30s through 50s of casting a Caucasian person as an Asian person by changing the makeup or black yeah. face or anything like that. Yeah, mm -hmm. without question. Well, it goes into also, I think it was Cecilia and maybe Karen and Saida talking about the business of mm -hmm television and movies and cables and streaming, because that is a factor too. So Saida, the the uh, example you used with a black actress 
playing Anne Boleyn. So then there's always the wonderment or the calculation of, do the creators understand, are they banking on that mm -hmm. conversation about what? Like, because will that generate enough interest for people to tune in? And then hopefully the quality of the work right. keep, keeps them watching or if it's a series or, or whatnot. Um, but so I thought that the Bridgerton conversation was really interesting and then seeing what's coming out from it. And I know uh, productions are, you know, years in the making, but uh, mm -hmm. recent trailers with like for Dune with uh, Zendaya and Timothy Chalamet and mm -hmm. I think Jason Momoa, and then just the way the trailer looks are like, oh, it's all kinds of people. It's all kinds of bodies. It's all ages. It's that's, that feels like a significant step forward, like to really have big budget movies and series to just automatically say the cast should look the way the world look. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. that's not that, that's good business. Not only is it good for society and culture, but it's good business yeah. because don't you want as many viewers, as many customers as possible? Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, it broadens your market. Yeah. yeah. And I think you sometimes it like the creators, you just kind of have to like shut out the white noise mm. like some of it is a lot of white noise about what will sell and what won't sell mm. like, i was told by a tv producer that your book sounds great but there's just not enough white people in it yeah right that was his I've exact heard people word. say that they've been told like, that there's just there's wow. not yeah. enough white people sorry it's just yeah. the way the industry is and another was that about Assembly of the Dead assembly I, of the dead. I'm not I kind of love that's, that's the whole point in 1906 of it. you know like the, the, you know, like, but literally those were his exact words. I had another mm -hmm. like location manager say to me, you know, if you really want this to be a hit, you need to make your main character, the detective, a white man. You need yes. to make it. And I'm like, so you want me to write a book about a European detective who comes and saves a bunch of Moroccan women from the barbaric Moroccan men because nobody can do it themselves. Like, you know, like, oh, gosh, that's never been written you know, before. like, yeah. it's never. But you know that, yeah, and you yeah. kind of, you have to kind of, I think you have to just cancel the noise out and yeah. tell the story you want to tell. Because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. otherwise you're, ne you're never, like, you're, otherwise you're never going to see that kind of diversity, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? Let, you're let never going to see it. Let me ask you this, Saida, because I enjoyed, I enjoyed Assembly of the Dead for so many different reasons. Um, the feeling of it, it felt like 1906, the language, um, the way you convey layers of culture and like dynamics based on gender and religion and um, Farouk, I loved Farouk. Um, <laughs> and so, He's like my ideal man. <laughs> so what I want to ask you, though, is did you start out as a historian that also writes or did you start out as a writer with an interest in history? Because you do you do both beautifully. It's so I wish I had more language to describe how much I enjoyed that. OK, go. I mean, literally, I, I think I just started off on a on, on an Internet website that I discovered this sto true story of the Moorish Jack the Ripper. And it just took me down this historical route. Like I knew nothing about Morocco, like pre 1970s, quite honestly, <laughs> let alone 90s, but ended up like doing that research for, for that period. And what um, I learned was yeah. that there are so many stories that don't get told right they just never get told and mm. i was you know repeatedly told no one's interested no one was is going to buy it no one cares you know it's just not mainstream it's not going to get mainstream readers and you just have to go i don't care whether it gets mainstream right. readers or not i know this story right. is like compelling and so i'm just going to tell the story as it's told and not worry about all these other things that mm. will get in the way and make it i don't know pollute it with ideas that lose you know, you're a storyteller. Yeah. Okay. It's That's really you at, the, at your core. It's really potent. So, and you might not know yet, but my hope is, is there going to be another Farouk? Because it totally works as a police procedural as well. And it just feels like a series is a natural progression. Yeah. So I, I, there's, it's a th trilogy and the next one is oh. 1912 when, when France kind of 
basically wins Morocco, right? When France right. finally, Morocco is a French protector, it's under French co co colonization, and Farouk shows up in 1912 when that ki kind of chaos breaks out. Oh, oh so, fantastic. Yeah, I've just got to write it. I've just kind okay. of got to write it. Also, the, uh, a thread, because I did read um, uh, 18 Days of Spring and Winter, and of course I read your contribution to uh, We Wrote in Symbols, that anthology, and are you, is it conscious? Is the, it seems like there's a thread with your writing of like transitions, cultural shifts, and and then drilling down to like the 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 individual how those those shifts uh, impact the individuals. It, has that been a conscious thing on your part, or is that just kind of gone with where your interests have been, or? I don't know. I don't think it. I mean, you're you're saying it, and I'm thinking, oh, really? Is that that is that what I'm doing? So it's like I need to go back and read it to make sure. But I definitely like you know, like I think like growth and transition as part of the human experience, and embedding it in a character is like what I love. You know, I think you've got these grand stories of change, and then you've got these kind of minute stories of individual change. And they are so interrelated and interconnected. And I think I love telling stories of people, try, you know, changing in a context that's changing. Okay. And I, and you know, I, I, feel I like that kind of dynamic. So I'm going to investigate further. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's what that's what really popped out for me from reading, you know, multiples of your work. And then a similar question for Cecilia because I'm more familiar with your. Um, your uh, Secrets of a Rockstar series, and I read your contribution mm -hmm. in Silk Threads. And what really pops out for me is, is it intentional on your part with how you intertwine really deep emotional intimacy and complexity with really explicit material in a way that it feels very balanced, the explicit material, scenes never feel like a caricature or mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. even when it's a little bit over the top it doesn't feel over the top it feels like a natural mm -hmm. expression is that something have you always had that is it something you had to hone i I'm, I'm sure i've honed my erotica abilities over over time i mean but that was where i started i mean my very first published book in 1992 was was I had to self-publish called Telepaths Don't Need Safe Words, um, where mm -hmm. I, you know, I was putting science fiction and erotica together and people in 1992 were like, no, you can't do that. That's like mm -hmm. forbidden. These two things never meet. And I was like, this mm -hmm. is like, doesn't make any sense to me. And once I put them together, of course, people were like, oh, it is just like when the chocolate and the peanut butter get together, it's delicious. And it's like, yes, it is. Yeah. Um, <laughs> now, of course, <laughs> you know, paranormal romance is one of the top selling parts of romance and, you know, so forth. Yes. So it's like people understand that these two things can go together. Um, but it's, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, to me, the, the point is that the better the characters get to know each other, the better and more graphic sex they can have. Mm -hmm. um, and the reader comes along with you for that ride because the point is not what, what tab goes you know whether tab a goes into slot b it's mm. why and how do they mm -hmm. feel about it happening mm -hmm. and to me the point of having <clears throat> like a really explicit scene <clears throat> with lots and lots of you know juicy details is because you're actually drilling down into the emotions of the characters and you know and so whether it's you know a cyberpunk story or, or a rock star story which is a lot of fantasization you know mm -hmm. might as well be in a parallel universe in some ways you know uh, or hollywood heiress you know or billionaire i mean i've written you know billionaire romance also mm -hmm. yeah it's part of the part of the fantasy but you have to make it real by making those emotions and that that internal stuff and that's why my stuff i think is going to be very hard to adapt to the screen ever personally mm -hmm. because it would have to be x-rated <laughs> to be you know it's like you literally just couldn't put most of the words on the screen um but you know how do you get to that interior level of the characters of drilling down into the emotions and it's like in an adaptation you have to rely on the actors to be the ones who are who are doing that and that's you know that's where it would have to come from right. and that's it's exactly the same issue that I have because there's a lot of sex, Carden can tell you, in, in my books. And it is, mm -hmm. it's mostly the characters, it's for a couple of people, it's the only way they really understand how to really communicate on that deeper level mm -hmm. at first. Mm -hmm. And um, 
part of some of the themes are about coming to terms with your sexuality and and, yeah. uh, and, mm -hmm. and ethics or morals involved if you're a religious person all kinds of stuff and so yeah it's very very graphic and, and i felt comfortable writing that because I've seen the excerpts from E.L. James, and I can do so much better than that. Oh my God. <laughs> um, I, I was just going to say, if they can put Fifty Shades on the screen, they can put they can, an, yeah. an Outlander. They can put your work on the screen, Karen. <laughs> Here's hoping. Here's hoping. <laughs> and so, LP, let me ask you this: with your Obsidian Pen Publishing, what's your what's your dream for that? Oh, that's interesting. Um, originally, Obsidian Pen was uh, created for my kids. They wanted to start their own comic series. And um, one of my daughters is an amazing artist. Um, she's just turned 13 and she is really fantastic. Mm -hmm. And my oldest, who is 17, she was into character development and, you know, the whole marketing thing. They left me standing with the ball. So I have a publishing company and no comic series written by my children. So, <laughs> so what I did instead, I took um, a book that I had written a while back um, that is a, um, a, writer, a piece of erotic fiction. And I decided I'd just publish it and just see how I did. Um, it's called mm -hmm. Only Human. And it is an interracial um, romance novel. It is erotic, very, and um, not to give anything away, but the guy has some telepathic abilities. So figured I'd play with that idea as well, because I mean, you know, it's fun to think about that stuff and wonder like, okay, what would it be like, you know, to knock boots with a vampire or what, a, what would it be like the, you know, bump pelvises with a guy that can read your mind, you know, that kind of thing. So, you know, let's write it, because I haven't, you know, haven't read that before. So. Nice. Like and so is that, a, uh, where's that available, LP? It's on Amazon. Okay, gotcha. I'm almost, gotcha. I'm almost scared to put it out there, but yeah, it's, no. on, <laughs> it's on Amazon. But, but you know, I, to go back to what Saida said earlier about, ultimately, I think all of us as self-published or indie published, at one point, you write what you feel compelled to write, and then you put it out there because it's the thing you needed to create. Um, and, and I understand that publishing is a business, but when you first start out, especially for your first project, when you don't have an agent, you don't have a deal, you don't, you just have this idea that you want to pursue. For me, it feels like the best work is when you're doing it because you need to do it, not because there's a deadline or you've been paid a royalty or whatever. And I'm not saying those things aren't significant or important, but for the motivation to really write, because we've probably all talked to people that when we share that we're a writer or that we're a published author, they're like, oh, I have this great story you should tell. And it's like, no, I have a laundry list in my head of the stories mm -hmm. I should tell. If that's interesting to you, you should write it. You should write oh, I'm not a writer. And I'm like, writers write. That's, that's how you become a writer, mm -hmm. is you write. And yeah. so, but the genuine writers write. And even when people share with me that they've written something, but they've been afraid to show it to anybody. And I was like, mm -hmm. well, you've, you've cleared the first hurdle, which is you wrote it. Yeah. So then you have the time to decide what, you, if anything, you're going to do with it, who, if anyone, you're going to show it to. But you did the big part, the hardest part, which is to write it. Um, so, and I know we live in a world that rates things by getting paid for it and how much you've gotten paid for it and how big the publisher is or blah, blah, blah. And I, I understand that from a business calculation, but from a creative calculation, I just wish mm -hmm. we valued as a society more the doing. And of course, disproportionately, it's women that end up doing a lot of stuff and not getting financially compensated for it. Mm -hmm. I definitely agree with that. I always say to people, if I wanted to be rich, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be writing. I'd work no. in a bank. Yeah, if you're no, like writing, I'd work in a bank. Why would I be writing? <laughs> the like the slowest way of getting to get rich is the is the slow <laughs> the slowest way of getting the coins in. It's just mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it really Wait, is. A profit? <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
But when I finally had a book, you know, sort of breakthrough and it was in billionaire romance because there was a, yeah, after Fifty Shades, there was a big sort of gold rush into that mm -hmm. genre. And of course, I'd been writing very kinky graphic things for already, you know, more than 20 years before that. And uh, so the pole publishing industry that had been telling me, no, 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 you're too no. graphic for us, all of a sudden was like, oh, wait, yes, give us one, you know, and it was like, that really had nothing to do with me. I, my core story was always about telling about how characters negotiate their boundaries. It was always about interrogating consent. Like that's my core story, whether it's happening in a cyberpunk universe or, or a fantasy universe or contemporary, whatever it is, that's always where my characters are, are where the conflict is, is between their boundary setting between themselves, right? And it's like, so all of a sudden that became, you know, first Fifty Shades and then of course Me Too coming right on the heels of that. That is not an accident, you know, because I think the driver of the Fifty Shades story is also, you know, Anna kind of pushing back and trying to set her boundaries. And she never does, but she tries, <laughs> you know, I mean, like th that I think was the thing that really lit people up without them realizing it you know that mm -hmm. sort of and now we're seeing it you know that kind of story busting out all over and mm -hmm. it's like if yeah um and i didn't expect that you know mm -hmm. i didn't expect that and now i'm back to writing things that nobody but my core readers really want to read but, but what, you know, are you, what are you writing what are you writing now well actually i'm writing a series for tour books that's going to be an urban fantasy um mm -hmm. and that you know where where basically the 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 paranormal magic altered through um BDSM and sex yeah, yeah. Um, and of course the bad guys do it non-consensually and the good right. guys do it consensually right, and it's right, much right. more difficult to do consensually because you've got to negotiate everything and you know so forth and yeah so it's uh it's it's not out yet it will be out okay. as Tor tells me real soon now um but yeah so <laughs> <laughs> well, we will look at that. In another year. So, so I'm hoping that one will will kind of, yeah, we'll push the conversation the next step. But we'll see. Okay, that sounds good. And let's That's see. So, uh, Saida, you're saying that the Farouk uh, arc is going to be three stories, and are you at the outlining for the second story stage, or what? Where are you with that? Um, I've I've written half of it, and then oh. I. Oh. So I, I got about halfway through the first draft and then okay. I stopped. So the, the first book was optioned just before lockdown. So random, completely random scenario and ended up being optioned in, in just before lockdown. And then it is great, but like it's like it's great. But it's a massive learning experience because you mm. kind of start to realize just how difficult it is to get something through because mm -hmm. every step you could kind of just it could just fall apart right okay. this mm -hmm. is such a slow process so like i've spent the last 18 months working with a co-writer who's based in the us mm -hmm. and on writing the pilot for the tv series wow based on the book and and it's literally been 18 months of wow. and when i've calculated it so we're at the point where we finished finished the first draft and I, cal I calculated that I've spent about 700 hours oh, wow. on writing it with her right. and that's like mm -hmm. at one point it was like uh three evenings a week for three hours that's wow. how regular mm -hmm. it was that we were meeting wow. so we've literally finished by and by finished I mean I'm expecting someone to send me an email next week and say can we we, we looked at this bit again and can you do you mind like jumping mm -hmm. and, and changing something here wow. but yeah so well, yeah. congratulations Thank it's you. so well deserved it's well, so it's, well deserved I'm, I'm just I'm celebrating this moment I'm not celebrating <laughs> just this moment just, like I'm trying yeah, to yeah, this one, yeah, yeah. the moment now I'm not yeah. nothing Future. It's this moment that needs celebrating. That's the best way to do it. Now, Karen, what are you working on? Now, I know you shared before we started recording that your teaching schedule is really jam packed. So I don't even know if you've had any time to work mm -hmm. on. I kind of partly started entirely new things from the superheroes that fizzled out one in 2020 for various life happens reasons. And now my teaching schedule is ridiculous. Um, but I, um, the this book in the series, finally the Miriam book that people had asked for, is almost done being edited. So close after a couple of years worth of work. And my editor has a few more things to send me. So I've been revising away with that 
Okay. No, that sounds good. And let me just for the other panelists and for the audience to just say that, so her Persistence of Memory series, so there's four books in it. The first three books have a certain kind of arc and tone. And then this fourth book, Wise Men, uh, really Karen and I talked about a little bit earlier, which is a little bit of a prequel for the first three books. It kind of gives a more intimate backstory from for some of the key characters. And I think Karen had said that she had written that uh, kind of inspired by feedback from readers and what they wanted to know about the feature characters. So, and then I think the Miriam book is, falls into that uh, being motivated by readers' feedback as well, if I'm, if I'm characterizing that correctly. Actually, the first three books, were originally one huge behemoth of a book. And my editor said, you can't publish it like this. And he helped me find natural stopping places and tweak the endings a little bit. So really it's kind of a serialized trilogy and then the prequel. No, that sounds good. So LP, you shared with us that your kids uh, baited and switched you <laughs> again. To, yeah. To get yeah. Started. Yeah, but so my dream for Obsidian Pan Publishing is to just, you know, I'm a I'm a huge Toni Morrison fan. So one of my favorite quotes is, "If there's a book you want to read, then you write it." So that is the motto I live by. So the dream of Obsidian Pen Publishing is to you know just help authors get their stuff out there. That that that's that's the dream of it. Um, my kids are going to have to start their own little comic <laughs> series publishing company because I've taken Obsidian Pen and I've already published an erotic fiction book, and so we can't mess with. It. <laughs> they snooze, they snooze, they lost. <laughs> snooze, you lose in the business, baby. <laughs> Gotta keep it moving. Oh, yeah. That's fantastic. Well, I think you can feel that I think we could talk for another hour. Uh, we kind of scratched the surface. We let adaptations take us to some other places that I think were really interesting um, and thought provoking and powerful. So I want to thank you all for that. Um, and I also want to make sure that everybody get to say what they wanted to say. Is there anything else you wanted us to know about or to mention? Um, and you can think about that while I'm ch um, chatting away uh, and thanking people and whatnot, and just just jump in if you think, hey, I did want to say this as well. Um, so while you all are thinking, I will say this, which is, um, I just want to say many thanks to each of you because, you know, the world is crazy in general, and then it's, you know, multiple times crazy in a pandemic, a resurgence of a pandemic, <laughs> you know, like the swinging back and forth, the craziness, um, trying to do things virtually and coordinate. We're not even all on the same continent. So um, I just really appreciate you all. Um, I appreciate your saying yes and for making the time today. Uh, you know, on a weekday, a lot of things going on. So just thank you, thank you, thank you for contributing your time and your talents um, and your really deep thoughts and really enjoyable commentary. Um, I think people are going to enjoy this. Um, so I thank you for that. And I also want to thank um, Heather Brooks, our Right Women Book Fest event founder, Marietta House Museum, who's been our um, partner and venue from our very first year in 2019. Uh, this year, we have new partnerships with the Prince George's County Memorial Library System. Um, they've uh, particularly the Bowie, the South Bowie, and the Laurel branches who uh, have put up these really lovely um, displays in their branches. I mean, we couldn't have asked for better than that. Um, and uh, with Prince George's County um, Memorial Library System, uh, the CEO, Roberta Phillips, and Nicholas Brown, whose actual title I've forgotten, so please forgive me, but mm -hmm. they have been particularly supportive and we really appreciate that. And our partnership this year with uh, the Barnes & Noble store at the Bowie Town Center in Bowie, Maryland. Um, we're super grateful. Let me just get my checklist. I don't want to forget people. Um, oh, and then we have additional partners listed uh, on our website, the rightwomenbookfest.org. And special thanks to the Not So Secret uh, Society for their provocative discussions um, about Bridger the Bridgerton books in the series uh, and their uh, engaging interviews with um, the Right Women Book Fest 
2021 participating authors. So let me say to the panelists too, because I was supposed to email this to you, uh, if you would like to be interviewed with them, with the Not So Secret Society, please do reach out to them. They have been lovely and so supportive um, of us and our participating authors. So Karen, you don't have time in your schedule. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> And LP, you might not either. And also, Saida, with all your, your revisions, and so maybe nobody on this panel <laughs> has time. But if you can squeeze it in, uh, definitely reach out to them. <laughs> definitely reach out to them. They've been super supportive. So let me just open it up. Any last words from anyone? Um, none other than I would love to have each and every one of you come and read for the Literary Cipher at some point. I'll get your contact information and reach out. Yeah. And what I'll do is if you all are okay with it, I'll send an email before when I was sending group emails, I never like to presume that people are okay with sharing their contact yeah. information, but I'm happy to send an email where you all can see your addresses and then that way you all can communicate directly. You don't need me as the, as the go between. <laughs> Yeah, I guess my, my only closing comment is I hope we can do it in person someday <laughs> that we'll be able to get back and have these kind of talks, you know, in a room instead of in the Zoom. <laughs> in the room instead of the Zoom. Yeah. But I will say this too, like, um, I, of course, in my heart, I would like for this just pandemic to be over, but this is only our third year of the Right Women Book Fest, so we wouldn't have the budget, like, Saida's not even on our same continent, so right. virtual actually, <laughs> you know, opened up our opportunities and gave us a chance that at least at this point in our evolution, we wouldn't have been able to do. So again, I want to thank you, Saida, because you're not on our continent, you're not on the same timeline. <laughs> like, oh all that. No, thank you for inviting me. I feel like it's a real privilege to be like amongst you guys and part of your festival. It's so great to be doing, you know, a festival in, in the US with you guys. And mm -hmm. I saw kind of, you know, the website and the stuff that you're doing. I think it's just exactly where we is kind of breaking those kind of barriers of publishing and really trying to change it. And I love that. So for me, thank you for inviting me. I'm, you pleasure. are most welcome. It, it's just been a real, it's real been a joy. It's been a joy. Um, Karen, yes. we know from the first year, Cecilia, I had read your stuff before. Um, LP, that's a new, you know, when you reached out to me for the literary cipher and all that. And then Saidi, I think our connection was through your publisher, because when I reviewed, we wrote in symbols. So it's just the networking or the connections and just asking people like, well, the worst that can happen is they can say la say no and laugh at me. <laughs> so when you said yes, that was, for all of you, when you said yes, that was um, quite the gift. So I thank you personally. Uh, Heather, thanks you all. And um, just keep writing because your your voices, your words are necessary and enjoyable and inspiring.